Uh, please, uh, please uh, open your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 13. So it is uh, a holiday weekend, Memorial Day weekend, and some of you are fired up. You get to sleep in tomorrow, barbecue. Uh, We love our teens. <laughs> Amen. So uh, it is a time to remember those who uh, served and sacrificed their life. And it is a uh, Sunday morning uh, service. So the title of the lesson is Remembering Jesus. Remembering oh. Jesus. And there's so much to think about when it comes to Jesus. How do you narrow it down? Well, I just did. I narrowed it down just uh, for the sake of time. Uh, to three topics, and hopefully you can remember them, uh, poise, pressure, and purpose. Mm -hmm. Jesus' poise, how he handled pressure, and his purpose. So let's look at his poise. And um, so poise, uh, imagine a young boy, maybe a teen, uh, grabbing a broomstick and then balancing it on their finger. Have you ever done that? Yes. Yes. Right? And so poise is being able to stay upright while forces are trying to get you to come down. That's poise, being balanced. And uh, most of us, we have a weakness. There is something that can take us out. And uh, actually what uh, Chevelle shared today uh, shook me a little bit. Now I'll share a little bit about that. Uh, but let's take a look here um, in verse 31. Luke 13, verse 31, poise. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. <laughs> okay, so a death threat. How does Jesus handle it? Has anyone here ever uh, had a death threat? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, it was interesting uh, this morning. Uh, our very own Corey was picking up a friend, and uh, the father came out and said, I've got your license plate, and it's not going to happen today, but within the next 30 days, I'm going to come find you, and I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I was like, how are you feeling, Corey? He's like, I'm fired up. <laughs> right, okay. Amen. So that a death threat doesn't... Uh, um, you know, it doesn't knock Corey over. So, yeah. um, I know with uh, if Herod did it, maybe it would knock you over. Yeah. Who, who is this guy, Herod? Well, he's the one that killed his cousin. He actually beheaded his cousin, John. That's Herod. And his father, Herod the Great, um, 30 years prior to this, trying to find Jesus and kill him, had every child... Uh, that was a year old or younger, killed. That's Herod and his family. And so if Herod says, I'm going to find you and kill, kill you, it is not an empty threat, yeah. right? It's, it's a serious issue. And so let's see how Jesus handles it. Verse 32, he replied, go tell that box. I will keep out on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. <sighs> So it didn't, it didn't yeah. knock him over, right? He had poise. Yeah. He was able to handle it. Um, but goals, what is your goal? What is your goal in life? It was interesting. Um, uh, every, if you're not part of the church, every last Saturday of the month, we gather up prayer requests, and then we spend an hour each Person, every, every member in the church, we spend an hour praying through that list. So we send out the list, and I have the list right here. It's um, 150 prayers. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. It's awesome just to see the hearts of people and uh, being able to go through that. And I go, some of these are like prayer requests, but some of them are just goals. You know, the first one on there, to find a household where the single brothers can live. Uh, is that really a prayer request? Like that's gonna happen. That's gonna happen. <laughs> you know, like, that doesn't even take faith. You just gotta go out and do it, right? Um, 
but there's some other ones, you know, for Josiah to get baptized, for my niece. Uh, oh, now their brother's one for a household. Uh, for the salt ministry to grow, to get more studies. Um, here's one. To pray that through God, I will compel others to become disciples of Come Christ. On, oh, okay. Call her out. <laughs> 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 these things these things take action right like we've got to go out and do it uh and i hope all of us have that heart that we want to go and compel others but really that isn't a god thing that's a us thing yeah. it is a, a heart to have to go out and do those things and here jesus is like nothing's going to stop me a death threat isn't going to stop me i have a goal and i'm going to go out and do it why because he has poise he's not shaken uh, even by a death threat. He says here in verse 33, in any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. And so for preaching the word, all the prophets in the past had died. And he's like, I'm okay right now. I'm heading to Jerusalem, but I'm okay right now where I'm at. I'm in Galilee. And I'm going to preach the word. I'm going to keep going. But he knew that on the third day, he was going to reach Jerusalem. And then it's on. Um, let's keep reading. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. You know, uh, the thing that Chevelle shared earlier rocked me and so uh i was baptized in 93 and um it was it was awesome you know to to learn what it meant to be a true disciple of jesus um and then to just to witness people actually living that way um that that is really what convinced me um to see people actually doing it um and there are times when we have to get open about who we really are, yeah. right? And uh, at first it was a little scary, but after a while I got into it, you know, just sharing who I was in the past because I was fired up because that's not me anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then I was studying the Bible with a guy uh, 10 years later and he said he had committed murder. And I was like, oh, like this is, this is a first for me. And, and I was like, uh, what happened? You know, <laughs> my knees are shaking a little bit. And uh, he said he had convinced his girlfriend to go get an abortion. Mm -hmm. And he just started crying. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I did that. And I had never put that together that I had committed murder. And it shook me. Mm -hmm. It shook me. And I had to wrestle with the fact that God still loves me even though I hadn't connected those two together before, right? Um, <clears throat> what Chevelle shared today shook me. There was a time when um, I had, I was going to a different church and Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, believe with your heart, uh, you know, you know that scripture yeah. that if you just say Jesus, Lord, you're saved. And I did that. And then I started teaching that. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh. How many people did I hurt teaching that? Because uh, that's not that's not the whole story. Yeah. <laughs> like there's repentance. You know, everyone believes there's repentance. But nowhere in Romans 10 is that word even used. Like you can't just take one verse and, and, and say that is the end all. Like you got to really understand uh, what you're getting yourself into. And I, um, I heard a lot of people. And so what Chevelle shared today really shook me. That uh, I remember being shook in 93, uh, how many people I had introduced to drugs who had never done drugs before. And then they got addicted to it because of my influence. I was thinking just after, you know, just during the fellowship break, like what is worse introducing someone to drugs or introducing to someone to false hope? Mm 
where they think they're going to heaven and they're not. Like, man, I got to get to work. <laughs> I got to get to work. I got to reach people. I got to help people. He says here in verse 35, look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so he's talking about the future. People who bring the good news are those who come in the name of the Lord. That's us. It says we are blessed when we come in the name of the Lord. And so we have an opportunity this week. I want to challenge you. Write this down. Pray about it. But then don't just pray about it. You got to do something. No matter if if someone threatens your life, (laughs) go out. Don't let this, don't let whatever distract you. We have an opportunity. We have the Gonzaleses coming next week. Let's fill this whole room up. This is, next week is going to be the last week we're going to be in this room. Uh, Bob and I walked upstairs to look at the new room. It's twice this size. It's going to be awesome. But let's fill up this room next week. Let's have every brother just have to stand in the back you know what i'm saying because we we just filled it up let's do that next week let's make a decision all of us bring two people if all of us bring two people like it's going to fill up and and i hope that's your heart that you understand that blessed is the one who comes and the name of the lord and it's going to take poise because there's going to be things that are going to want to distract you from this goal and so stand like jesus poise I'm going to set a goal and nothing is going to stop me. Poise. Okay, let's look at pressure. Luke chapter 22. You guys with me? Luke 22. Are you feeling pressure? I actually heard that uh, this week. Don't pressure me. I don't want a bunch of disciples pressuring, peer pressure. It's a real thing. We feel pressure. Being a disciple, being like Jesus, you're going to feel pressure. In verse 39, it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. So here, uh, just for a little side note, this is where he went, and this was his usual thing. Uh, It's interesting. I'll... uh, I'll go downstairs where, you know, the brothers live, and I'll go, uh, where's Nassim? And everyone goes, I don't know where he is. And then they'll go, oh, he's probably praying. That happens every single time. When we don't know where Nassim is, he's, he's out praying. And so with Jesus, when he heads to Mount of Olives, what's he going to do? Pray. He's going to go pray. He has his usual spot, his usual thing. I want to have that. When people don't know where I'm at, I want them to go, oh, he's, he's at the lake. He's on that bench. He's praying. Yeah. Like, we should have a spot, all of us, to be like Jesus, to have that usual spot. Oh, that, was a, that was a little nugget on the side. Okay. Verse 40. <laughs> on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed. This is a, another thing that... God taught me this morning as I was reading this. You know how we get tempted and then we pray, God, don't let me fall into this sin. Prayer can keep you from the temptation. That's the power of prayer. And so you can pray not even to be tempted. This is from our Lord. And so you got to take that to heart. You can pray, God, please don't let me fall in temptation. Verse 41. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. Well, that's how Jesus was able to make it. He had an angel come down and strengthen him. Okay, so keep your finger here and go to Hebrews chapter 11. I want to encourage you this morning. In Hebrews, I'm sorry, not chapter 11, chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Although Hebrews 11 is pretty awesome too. But the very last verse 
This is how you're going to remember it. From now on, you'll remember it. It's Hebrews chapter 1, the very last verse. It says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Yes. Yeah. And so when you're struggling, when you need to get down on your knees and pray because you're feeling pressure, God sends an angel. Because that's what angels do. They come and they give you strength. Okay, let's go back to Luke. So an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Verse 44. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So there's this medical account. This physician wrote uh, an article. And there's a section in it I want to read to you. Um, it says, the physical passion of the Christ began in Gethsemane. Of the many aspects of this initial suffering, the one of greatest physiological interest is the bloody sweat. It is interesting that St. Luke, the physician, is the only one to mention this. He says, and in being in agony, he prayed the longer, and his sweat became as drops of blood trickling down upon the ground. Every ruse or trick imaginable has been used by modern scholars to explain away this description, apparently under the mistaken impression that this just doesn't happen. A great deal of effort could have been saved had the doubters consulted the medical literature. Though very rare, the phenomenon of hematidrosis or bloody sweat is well documented. Under great emotional stress of the kind our Lord suffered, tiny capillaries and sweat glands can break, thus mixing blood with sweat. This process might well have produced marked weakness and possible shock. Pressure. So he was under severe pressure. Um, I, I, I Googled it this morning, hematidrosis, <laughs> uh, and it explains what's happening. And it mostly happens in the face. Um, and you start sweating and blood mixes in there. And so I, I just can't imagine what he was feeling. Like what he was about to go through was intense pressure. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I remember something in my brain stopped working about 11 years ago and I felt my first panic attack. I thought it was a heart attack. Uh, and uh, it turned into like severe anxiety and deep depression. And it's hard for me to say that because I used to view that as a weakness, like someone just weak. And I think God allowed me to feel it so that I would get rid of that looking down on people, you know. Um, but it was intense. And I, uh, I, feel bad. I felt bad. I don't do this anymore. But I felt really bad for Jill because I was up at like 3 in the morning, like telling her I'm, I'm about to die. Like... Do we have, do I have a will? You know, I was just like freaking, freaking out. Just, just the intensity. I just didn't understand what was happening. I, I can look back now and, and, you know, laugh about it, but uh, it was, I just felt death on me. Like where I went was death. I'm, I'm going to die every time. And then I'd get through it. And then something else would happen. And I would go there mentally where I felt like I was going to die. And I was just appointed a shepherd over the church and this was happening and I was terrified to get out of bed to go do anything because I was going to die go ahead and turn over to second chronicles chapter 20 Luke the leader of the church who appointed Jill and I as shepherds came to my house after me missing a few weeks of church because I just I didn't it was like a perfect storm because we owned our own business and I didn't really need to be there for it to supply our needs. Like it just ran by itself. Um, if I had to be there, I probably would have got out of it sooner, just forcing myself to do things that I was afraid to do. But instead I just sat in bed and Jill had to cover everything. Uh, in verse 17, so what's happening here in, in 2 Chronicles 20 is there's a, a God's people and they're surrounded by an army that they cannot defeat. Uh, sure, they're sure going to die right here. <laughs> this army surrounded them and they're about to go to battle 
and they're going to die. Their, their army was 10 times greater than God's people. And here's what God says in verse 17. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. The Lord will be with you. Take up your position. He said to me, Dave, I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I just need you to go and sit right next to me. I was like, I can't sit in the front. Like, I got to sit in the back right next to the exit door. Like, I'm just, I can't do it. You know, he's like, okay, come take your chair. We'll put it right next to the exit door. But you got to be there. You got to, you got to be with me. You're my guy. So I did. I just sat there and I felt claustrophobic. And it was, it was a process that I had to go through uh, to get there. But I really appreciate that. He was like, take your position. Mm-hmm. You just got to take your position. And so uh, in the past, I think I did go through times um, of depression. But the way I handled it was uh, uh, drinking, you know, have a glass of wine, which turned into two to three. <laughs> um, I would just check out, watch movies. It was before Netflix. It's a lot easier to check out on Netflix. But I'd actually go pay my five dollars to see a movie back then and then i would just stay and watch two or three movies just to check out um sleep i would sleep and that's what these guys were doing go back to luke 22 these guys were feeling the pressure our lord's about to die and it's a real thing to want to just put a blanket over your head and not have to deal with the reality of what's to come. And what does Jesus say to them? In verse 46, he says, why are you sleeping? (laughs) He asked them, get up. In other versions, it says, rise. Take your position. And pray so you will not fall into temptation. It is a real temptation to just check out. To fall asleep, to not take a position. I'll just sit back here in the back row. Don't ask me to do anything. Don't ask me to be a Bible talk leader. Don't ask me to be an usher. Don't ask me. Even though you're super talented, you have more energy than anybody in the room, you just want to sit in the back and do nothing because you don't want to take a position. There's pressure in a position. I had several apologies today from people that have positions that they were running late. I'm like, it's all good. I love you. Thank you for serving. You know, like what would I do without you guys? Uh, it, it takes heart. You're not, we're all volunteers, right? Yeah. Like you come, you serve, you're a volunteer. Uh, there shouldn't be pressure volunteering for the church, but we want to be excellent in everything we do. So you feel that, that pressure. Mm-hmm. And what Jesus says is just rise and pray and take your position. And so I want to challenge you guys. If you do not have a position, get a position. Usher, song leader, Bible talk leader, evangelist. Yes, sir. Well, you don't understand. I'm I'm 50 years old. I was appointed at 51. Oh, well, I'm 63. Well, that's okay. Lance Underhill was just appointed at 63 as an evangelist. You know what kind of pressure there is as an evangelist? That's okay, because we just take our position, and God delivers the victories. You just got to take your position, whatever it is. I want to challenge you to take your position. Handle pressure like Jesus. Just pray, and the angels will come and give you strength. Purpose, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Verse one, it says, uh, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Purpose, love to the very end. 
You know what that means? Every day he woke up and he said, I'm going to love today. Mm. Isn't that awesome? Like that was his purpose. Every day I'm going to love. It says he did it to the very end. Think about that. On the cross, he actually said, brother, this is your mother. Mother, this is your son. Right? Like he was loving on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. No amount of pressure should be able to keep us from loving. Um, you might not know how to, but we can help you with that. There's a lot of needs. <laughs> uh, love is just not, uh, it, it's, an, it's a verb, right? Love. Yeah. It's an action word. We got to go and do stuff. You can't just say I love you and then not help people out. Uh, that's got to be our heart. Uh, let's keep reading. Verse two. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. It's so interesting to me that his version of love in this story is washing the feet. Um, I remember Michael Williamson, before he left to London, he got all the brothers together and he said, I'm going to wash your feet. And I, I refused, but I, I, I tricked him. I just said, I'm going to just take pictures. You know, I just walked around. I didn't want him touching my feet. My feet are gross. I'm like, oh, touch my feet. It just cringeworthy for me to think of washing someone's feet. But he did that. And uh, I go, okay, what's he doing here? What is, what is he trying to say about washing someone's feet? Let's, let's keep reading. Well, one thing for sure, in verse 2, he talks about Judas, that Satan had already prompted Judas. Now, no one knew that Judas was the betrayer except Jesus. And so he even washed Judas's feet. And so there's an unconditional aspect to his love. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now that I, uh, what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Mm -hmm. then, then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. <laughs> Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Stop for a second. So there's two aspects to this washing of the feet. Mm -hmm. One is a spiritual aspect. Um, so you have the need to get baptized as a disciple for your sins to be washed away. He's like, you guys are all clean. Um, and there's also the aspect of, uh, you know, when you fall back into sin, which we all do, right? Uh, you don't become perfect at baptism. <laughs> uh, you got to continually get washed through the blood of Christ, through confession, repentance, and walking in the light. And so there's the spiritual aspect of it. And so we need to help each other with that. Um, the other one is the physical. Um, and so he's like, you guys have already had a bath. Just your feet need washing. And why? Well, there's no paved roads. There's just dirt roads, right? And so they're walking around with sandals in the dirt. And so there's a need for their feet to be washed. Mm -hmm. It feels good. Get that sand off. Get that dirt out of there. And you have clean feet. And so for us, we got to make sure that we want to imitate Jesus in that way. Uh, there are physical needs. And so sometimes I'll get a call and they'll go, you know, this person is uh, stressed out. They, want, they don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. They're trying to get things done around their house. And what should I say to them? Like, don't say anything. Get over there with a broom and help them out. That's, that's what we got to do. It's not a time 
to rebuke anybody. It's a time to meet the need. It's a time to love them. It's a time to go and, and serve them. Show them how you love them by what you do. Um, uh, we've got to make sure we do that. You know, June 18th, it's going to be a great opportunity to go and serve. And uh, we've chosen a few people in our church where we're going to go and serve them. And we're going to go meet uh, a, a need. Um, and I'm really excited. I'm really excited about it. Because, you know, it's one thing to go to a place where you don't know anybody you serve. And it feels good. But, man, helping a disciple, mm-hmm. it's going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. And, and I hope you guys are fired up about that. Mm-hmm. We need to have a ministry built on love. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Um. We need to imitate Jesus. We need to have that same purpose. And, you know, you don't wake up. I know you don't. You don't wake up going, I'm going to love people today. Like, first you need to get some coffee. You know, (laughs) you need to pray. You need to read some Bible. Uh, But it is Memorial Day weekend. And it's time to remember. And I want us to remember Jesus. And tomorrow, if you're at a barbecue or whatever you're doing on your day off, consider that. What can I do to love? How can I be like Jesus and love? How, how do we do that? Well, look at uh, verse 3. It says here, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God. Jesus knew that he had come from God. We all have come from God. The Bible says that he created us in our mother's womb. We all come from God. Do you believe that? Jesus believed that. And it gave him uh, the heart to serve even Judas. Because he knew he came from God. When you know you come from God, all insecurity is gone. You don't worry about what you look like. Uh, or how you sound to other people, or even your funky feet, uh, you know, being washed, when you know you're from God. It says, and he was returning to God. When you're confident in your salvation, when you know that you're going to get to go be with God for eternity, it should motivate you to want to love like Jesus. When we don't love like Jesus, you've forgotten. You've forgotten that you've come from God. And that you're going to go be with God for eternity. Let's close out in verse 34. John 13, 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You've got to have poise like Jesus. Don't let anything move you from our purpose. You got to be able to take pressure. There is pressure in loving people, especially if you know that they don't love you back like Judas. But we still got to love unconditionally. Don't let that uh, shake you. We got to be about our purpose. We've got to love people. We have an opportunity this Sunday. I want it to be on your heart as you leave. Let's fill this place up. Let's show people that we are disciples by the way that we love each other, the way that we take care of each other, our purpose, our poise. When things are tough, we're still at peace because God is where we are going. As we remember Jesus on this holiday, his poise, his pressure, his purpose, let's go out and love like Jesus and to God be all the glory.